Well, I know it's been a while, but it's now time for another Hot Off the Bench. Well, hey everyone, and welcome back to another Hot Off the Bench. This is August of 2022. As I mentioned in my last video of the Pegasus Bill, I just didn't have enough time to put something together for July, but I did have time this weekend to put this here together for you guys and ready to get started. So before we begin the slideshow, I wanna make a correction here uh, about an error I made in the last slideshow. This is, uh, I think the last Hot Off the Bench was Wonderfest, so it's the one before that. Uh, take a look at this beautifully done model of a Pan Am Clipper. I mistakenly credited Nigel McLaughlin for this build, when in fact it was William Dunn who did a beautiful job on this. And so I apologize to William for that oversight just in the haste of putting everything together. It just went along too quickly. So thanks for your understanding. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started with our slideshow. <laughs> Well, I'm actually going to have Bill kick off our slideshow this month with a different Pan Am Clipper. This one is the Spacefaring Pan Am Clipper from 2001. Bill notes this is a 148 resin kit from Scott Alexander at Atomic City Models, and it measures 44 inches in length when completed. He explains it's a pretty heavy model, and he had to construct a special display made of steel tubing and a concrete paver to account for its weight. As you can see, he did a beautiful job detailing, painting, and lighting the ship. And to illustrate its size, Bill included this photo next to the Mobius Areas 1B. If you're interested in seeing some work in progress pictures, Bill was kind enough to provide a couple of links, which I've listed below for you. Just a beautiful replica of this iconic ship, Bill. Thanks for sharing. Next up is this moonship from Atlantis Models by modeler Raymond Legrand. The kit was originally produced back in 1957, and Raymond notes that the ship reminded him of the Icarus from Planet of the Apes. As you can see, he added LEDs for the interior and the exhaust, but he was also happy that he lit up the portholes along the bottom because they do a nice job with illuminating the base he painted to mimic the moon's surface. Raymond's exquisite work can also be seen in the interior detailing, which includes the astronauts that he decided to paint with white suits, similar to what was seen in Planet of the Apes. There is also an additional hanging spacesuit there, which he decided to paint silver. Beautiful job with this craft, Raymond. Thanks for sending these pictures. Now here's a unique piece. This is a replica from modeler Tom Puckett of a ship called the Vulture. It was seen in a short-lived TV series from 1979 called Salvage One. The show starred Andy Griffith as a salvage man whose dream it was to recover equipment left on the moon, and he ends up building his own spacecraft to help him do so. The ship on the show was constructed from a Texaco gas tanker for the main body and a cement mixer for the capsule. Tom says he's been wanting to build a replica of this ship for years, but he could never find the parts for it. And of course, 3D printing came to the rescue here, as Tom was able to find parts for this on Thingiverse. The link is listed below. He printed it with his Ender printer using silk silver filament. He then used Tester's paint along with Alclad to finish it off. It's been years since I've thought about this show, and this caught my eye while I was browsing through Facebook one day. Thanks for allowing me to share it here, Tom. Really cool piece. And staying in the 70s, we have this Viper from modeler Eugene Nolan, and this was constructed using a kit from Dynamic Digital Creations. After the model was primed, Eugene used Tamiya paints, and then he weathered it with shaved off pencil graphite, which he then rubbed on with his finger. He's built a few kits from Dynamic Digital Creations, and he says they're a lot of fun to work on and well-engineered. The model measures 21 inches in length, which he shows here next to the Eagle Moss Viper for scale. Another nice build there, Eugene. Thanks for sharing this impressive build. Always great to see this iconic ship. Next up is a scratch-built model, that's right, I said scratch-built, of the space pod from Lost in Space. This was constructed by modeler Richard Simon, who notes that it took him two years to complete this. The ship measures eight inches high and seven and a half inches deep. He used evergreen styrene sheets of varying thicknesses for most of it, and clear styrene for the windows. The antenna was made from sprue parts, and he created the fine wiring using medium fishing line, which he then attached with super glue. The retro rockets from tear shaped beads that he partially hauled out. He also crafted a working lot for the hatch door, and the landing pads are made to self level. The fusion core consists of 32 handmade sections. The model was painted with testers paints. Richard says there's a lot more to say about this incredible project. So if you have questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section. Congratulations on a fantastic build, Richard, and thanks for sharing this with us. And next up, we stay in the Lost in Space universe with Jim Crompton's build of the Jupiter II. 
This is the 12 inch wide model from Polar Lights, which he says he rebuilt twice to add more accuracy. The model has a built upper level interior and has accurate pilot seats. The lower deck wasn't built in order to accommodate batteries and the fusion core light element. I really love the cool renderings that Jim's provided here to showcase his build. Really nice there, Jim. Thanks for allowing us to see your work. And now it's time for some Star Wars kits, beginning with this amazing build of the Razor Crest by Nigel McLaughlin. This is the Ravel 172 scale Razor Crest, which is nicely constructed and painted. He used MIG ammo polished metal paint for the base color and MIG ammo gunmetal for the accents. He installed four to five LEDs that are orange for each of the engines, along with white ones for the interior. He also installed some fiber optics for the guns and placed some lights for the landing gear. The structure that you see in the background was 3D printed, to which he added a door using styrene sheet. The moisture evaporator was made from a marker pen, a sprinkler pipe and cap, old sprue pieces, along with some other spare parts. And if you look closely, you just might see an old MPC Snowspeeder engine manifold. The Tuscan Raider is from the Imperial Assault Board game, which just happened to be the right scale. The base is constructed of thin plywood along with plaster of Paris. Another awesome build there, Nigel. Thanks for sharing. And next, we have a paper model from Tim Striner, who is a master at this. This is what he calls a Star Wars Terminator mashup, and he titles it Sarah's Revenge. He says this gives the humans a fighting chance against the machines of Skynet. The model measures 17 inches tall and is 95% paper, with the exception of some tubing, a screw here and there, and the base that is made of plywood. All of the parts were cut using his 15 watt order laser, and the model has joints that are movable. Tim provided some work in progress pictures as you see here, and as I look at them, it's just hard to believe this is made of paper. Outstanding work there as always, Tim. Thanks for sharing. And here we have a submission by modeler Gavin Nicholson, which is a diorama featuring the duel between Obi-Wan and General Grievous. The platform they're standing on was scratch built on plywood, which he then wrapped in various types of styrene. This is the first time Gavin has used LED filaments. He used a 300mm one to light up the front edges of the walkway, and 130mm filaments for the sabers. He even added an Arduino Pro Mini to control the timing of the lights and sound. Obi-Wan is a black scale figure, and General Grievous is the 112th Bandai kit. Really cool display, Gavin. Thanks for sharing. And now let's wrap up the slideshow with some Trek models, starting off with Kenny Conklin's cloaked Romulan Bird of Prey. This 1-1000 Polar Lights kit is uniquely painted to mimic the ship with its cloaking device activated. Kenny used photo etch parts from Green Strawberry, which includes parts to modify the windows, engines, and add a shuttle bay. The model is displayed with a backdrop of a Starfield painted on canvas, and Kenny installed LEDs into it and used the HLI-002 effects board to simulate flickering stars. The board can be used for reactors, alien lights, and fire. Kenny did provide a link to a video which allows you to see the flickering effect, and I've listed it below. Really nice job there, Kenny. What a creative way of displaying this cool model. And here is another submission by modeler Gavin Nicholson, and it's a 3D printed model of Nomad. The build was inspired by the Nomad I did some time ago. For this, he used a filament printer. Gavin notes he designed his own lighting, which he fashioned to match the pattern seen on the show. And he also used a different sound module, which is a JQ6500 for the sounds. This turned out really great, Gavin, and I'm glad my video inspired you to try this. Thanks for sharing. And up next is a build by modelers Tony and Al Pasquale of the Galileo. This Polar Lights kit is 132 in scale, and they use Tamiya's Light Ghost Gray for the darker areas, and Tamiya's Light Gray for the lighter sections. Three mega-sized LEDs were placed inside a scratch-built light box to light up the impulse propulsion unit, and two other nano LEDs were used for the lights you see here in the front of the shuttle. All of this can be activated via a light switch that is concealed within the shuttle. And although they didn't light up the nacelles, Tony and Al did place polyfill fibers inside of the clear domes to add texture and color. The model is displayed on 11 by 14 base, which is done to recreate the look of the set of the show. A screen capture was used for the backdrop to further enhance the look of the display. And as a final touch, they added in two resin casts that they found on eBay of the anthropoids that the landing party encountered on the planet. Nice work, guys. Thanks so much for letting us take a look. And to end our slideshow, we have this very unique submission by modeler Christopher D. Virgilio of the dry dock pod seen in Star Trek The Motion Picture. This incredible display features the 120th resin replica available from Cosmic Scale Models based in the UK. 
Although the model comes with a base, Virgil wanted to recreate the famous docking scene from the movie. He used screen captures to guide him along the way, and Chris admits it isn't completely to scale. He scratch built the docking ring and added in portholes, navigation lights, and even a crew member peering through one of the windows. He tried to do Aztecing, but decided against doing so because it didn't meet his standards. Virgil originally intended on making this a wall display, but he didn't like the idea of having to install a rod from the back of it, so instead he made it a desk display. Virgil further mentioned that he is a disabled veteran with a condition that causes Parkinson-like tremors in his hands, arms, and head. Regardless of the challenges this poses, he continues to model build. He told me the entire build took over two months to complete, and I have to say all his efforts definitely paid off. What an incredible creation, Virgil. Thanks for allowing me to share this. Wow, just another collection of some incredible work there. Thank you guys for sending all those pictures and descriptions. I do appreciate it. It really is a pleasure to see all this stuff. I'm just constantly blown away at the level of workmanship. If you'd like to see your model on an upcoming slideshow, just send five or six good quality pictures to ismslideshow at gmail.com along with a brief description or any details you'd like me to mention. Okay, well now it's time to review a couple things about some tools that will help you out with model building. This in particular is gonna be dealing with soldering. Now those of you who are well informed about how to do this sort of stuff, this is nothing that's new. Uh, the rest of us though, who kind of stumble around with soldering and dabble in it here and there as we're building models, uh, hopefully you'll find this useful. And it was nice for me to come across uh, a couple new uh, little things that I could use to help uh, better my skill set at this. So uh, first thing I'm gonna talk about are these little clamps. And these are battery clamps uh, that happen to come up in a video that I was looking at to help me out with soldering strip lighting. In the past, I've had a little issue with trying to get the solder to sit right on the, uh, on the strip lighting ends and uh, so the video goes over that but one of the things he used were clamps to help guard the rest of the strip lighting from heat damage now they do make clamps specifically made for that but if you couldn't find them or if you can't find them because I couldn't uh, you can use these battery clamps they were suggested as well and they just simply clamp on at that point um, to protect the rest of the um, strip light from heat damage as I was applying on the solder and it worked out great and they're very inexpensive to get a hold of. So a link to the video is below. I'd suggest you watch it. These are, by the way, um, uh, recommendations I made in part one of my Pegasus build, but I thought they were worth repeating here. So the link to that particular video is below. And I provided yet another few links to uh, some videos that help you out with some tips on how to solder. And one of the things that came up in those videos is this stuff called resin paste flux. And I first heard about this in uh, corresponding with um, Kenny Conklin about the little HLI board that I was gonna be working with for the Pegasus. And this is one thing that he mentioned he uses to help him get solder uh, onto those boards. So I wasn't familiar with it. And sure enough, it came up in the videos that I've provided a link to below. And this was a big help having on hand with not only uh, soldering points to the board, but also in uh, getting solder to uh, sit properly on the connections as I was working with the other wired connections there. So take a look at the videos, uh, looking at resin paste flux and these heat clamps. Well, it's now time for our model tip, and this one comes from figure painter Joe Hudson. Now, Joe got into uh, 3D printing last year. He uses a liquid resin printer like I do. And if you'll notice here, he provided some pictures. Oftentimes your prints will come out with these lines on them or striations. And these are the layers that are created as the print is being made. Now sometimes those layers can be fairly prominent, other times not quite so much. But either way, you do have to take care of them, oftentimes by sanding. Recently, however, Joe tried this trick out and it's worked out really well. Uh, I'm gonna give it a shot myself. But what you see here is he's taken a brush and brushes on a fine layer of liquid resin. And you can see once he cures it with a handheld UV light, a lot of those layer lines and surface defects have been taken care of. Now one of the things that occurred to me is I was concerned this might obscure some of the detailing as you're applying more resin to this, but Joe said that has not been an issue for him. He's just applying these thin layers and it's worked out really well. So I'm definitely going to give this a shot. Thanks Joe for sharing that. Okay guys, well that is gonna do it for this segment of Hot Off The Bench. I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode and if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down below. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.